I'm with uh, Virginia State University Cooperative Extension. I am a specialist in aquaculture, fish health, and everything else when it relates to aquatic environment. Uh, Mark Klingman is our uh, is the host for today. He's hosting our program, and we have Cynthia Craig, who is an ANR agent from Brunswick County. Uh, she's got to monitor the chat box for questions. If you have questions, please put it into the chat box. We will uh, later on in the program put the email in uh, address for my uh, my email address in case you want to uh, attain a PDF file of the presentation today. This presentation will be recorded and it will be available later on once we get the the, uh, the video properly closed captioned. Uh, well, there is a lot of rules and regulations now on for public uh, distribution of information uh, to the public. So that's happened. We also have a YouTube channel on previous programs on aquaculture, pond maintenance. Um, this is probably the fifth or sixth pond maintenance workshop that we've done for the year at least. Um, so I want to welcome everybody today. Tracy Porter is not able to be here to be the MC for today. Uh, his aunt passed away. He's in a visitation today with the family. So let me see. So let's see if I can't share my screen for the today's program. There we go, share. Okay. screen. There we are. There we are. Basic pond management. Uh, that's the uh, topic today. We have about one hour to cover uh, this information. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, various things with pond management and some weed stuff. And hopefully we can do this in an hour's time. Um, Let's, let's get started here. Okay. One of the questions that's always asked, what's a perfect pond? Well, perfect pond is what you like. A uh, perfect pond could be a nice bass, bluegill population, a nice fisher, or it could be a wildlife refuge pond. Or it could be a pond that uh, just has a single motoculture of fish, uh, like catfish in a pond with aerators and you got 1,500 catfish per acre because you're trying to grow them to sell or raise. Or, or you like cr crappy fishing, which is not one species we like in pond, but, but uh, you might like that. So basically, what is a perfect pond? Perfect pond is what you think it is. Uh, it's your idea of what the pond should look like. It's your idea where or not uh, you got the right kind of fish in there, you get in the right kind of fish, you know, you might want to turn it into a, a uh, beach front property by having a little beach front. Uh, and you will probably want to develop some, some uh, plan for it, you know, sit down, write down, what do I want this pond to look like? Because it's your, your pond, not my pond. Uh, I've gotten in trouble many times by Look at a pond and say, oh, well, this is a perfect pond. And the owner would say, no, it's not perfect. Well, because it's not my pond. Uh, again, think of this as your yard, your lawn. And think about how much time you're going to have to spend. And better yet, how much money you want to spend. Because achieving a perfect pond is just like achieving that perfect yard or lawn. It going down to Lowe's every weekend, spending a couple hundred dollars to make it nice. Well, it's going to take some 
time and effort to make that pond nice. Or you could just let it become a natural pond with very low inputs into it. Again, what's the source of your water? Uh, ideally, you don't have cows in it. Um, you know, watershed ponds make up most of the farm ponds we have out there. Some have spring, some actually pump from rivers, might even have a well, but we don't want to have cows out there. Uh, do we have a sufficient watershed for your pond? You know, is it forest versus pasture? Do we have lime, limestone deposit because we like to have calcium carbonate getting into our water? Uh, we might, might be careful about how we lower the ponds because we might not get enough rain to fill it up. Again, pastures with manure, that's nutrients going in your water. Or if you got a pond in a neighborhood, residential area, you've got all those ponds, all those uh, houses fertilizing their grass that's running all that phosphorus into the water. Uh, again, uh, drought conditions determine whether or not that pond is going to be full. Rainfall is critical and the size and type of your watershed determines how well that pond is going to stay full during the time that you have it. Again, the pond is an ecosystem and at the top of the ecosystem is your fish. At the bottom you have your plants, your algae, and all that is feeding the system, the micro crustaceans, the smaller critters, the smaller fish, and it all starts with sunlight. Sunlight is the most critical aspect of the ecosystem of a pond because that's what fueling the plants to grow and produce the food items at the smaller trophic levels until we get to our fish. Okay, probably one of the most important management inputs if we're going to spend money is we want to see if our pond needs any lime. Do we need any agricultural lime in there? Because we want to make sure we have a productive pond. If we don't have enough calcium in the water, enough alkalinity in the water, we're going to have a poor producing pond. It's going to be underproducing. It's just like a garden. You know, every year, you know, you've got garden out there and you want to grow plants. Well, you add some lime to it, you know, you check to see if you need to put lime. Same thing with row crops. You go out there and check to see how much lime you go put out there. Uh, we like to see alkalinity at least well above 20 parts per million, calcium too. If we're below this minimum 20 parts per million and we like to see it higher, you're not going to get the pond that you want. Uh, we want to get this lime distributed over the bottom of the pond because the interaction of water with the soil at the bottom of the pond. Even after you lime it, you got to still have to look at reliming on a regular basis. Uh, every two to four years is one approach. Another approach is that you look at how much lime you need. Say you need uh, a ton per acre uh, uh, as a requirement for that pond. Uh, you can come every year and give one quarter of that. So if you need a ton, you can just, all you need is uh, 500 pounds every year added to that pond to keep that alkalinity and hardness up in a pond. One thing that you want to do is to get a more precise measurement of how much line that you want out a pond. One of the things that you want to do is take some mud samples for the pond, you're looking at six to 20 samples depending on the pond. Uh, you want to mix these mud samples up, let them dry, uh, break them up, put it in one of these little extension soil testing boxes, and you write on it, say, how much lime do I need to grow alfalfa? Alfalfa is very similar in requirement for a farm pond. So if you can uh, get the line requirement for alfalfa for a field, it will be uh, adequate for a farm pond. Uh, again, send it to a lab and they will tell you how much uh, uh, calcium carbonate you're going to need, agricultural line you're going to need per acre. Uh, again, this will give you the you precise. In bracing, you do various samples. You wouldn't go out to a field and just get one sample and have a test. Now you're getting many samples. Okay. Uh, 
if you got a pond that you're just starting to build or have ability to get a spray truck out there, you can do things like that, or you can get a boat and distribute that line evenly throughout the pond. Again, uh, you can do this yourself. You can hire folks to do this. So you got calcium carbonate, uh, calcium magnesium carbonate, and basically a lot of times you're probably looking at anywhere from one to two tons per surface acre. But even with that, I've seen where we've done uh, wine requirements for ponds and come back with like four tons per surface acre of water. Okay, alkalinity. This is what's going to make your pond hum. Having carbonates, bicarbonate. This is going to relate to our pH in the pond too, moderates pH. We like to see anywhere from uh, 300 to oh, up to 300 parts per million. Uh, 20 is our bare minimum. But now I would go with the bottom recommendation of 50 parts per million. So you want to have fairly high alkalinity in your water. Again, this is what we call carbonates and bicarbonates. Uh, and, and we would add the uh, carbonates and bicarbonates using agriculture line, calcium carbonate, in the fall, which is the best time to do this. You can uh, add it any time to your pond, but you can do this in the fall because it allows for the calcium carbonate to work into the muds and get a better interaction between the water and the muds. Uh, this is going to moderate the pH changes. If you don't have carbonates in your water, bicarbonate, you go see big swings in pH in a pond, and that can be uh, problematic with low pH uh, affecting reproduction in a pond. Hardness, we need that for good uh, for fish growth and actually for plants, uh, 20 parts per million. Again, if you add calcium carbonate, you go. Uh, if you put out 50 parts per million of, of, uh, of alkalinity, you're going to have adequate levels of calcium. Again, we add this in the hot fall to increase the hardness, and it's needed for plants and fish growth. Again, pH. Most farm ponds are between six and a half to seven. Uh, um, typically, most normal ponds are six and a half to nine. That's our safe area. But a lot of ponds tend to be in the lower end because they tend to be low in alkalinity. Um, um, adding agricultural lime or calcium carbonate to water is going to increase the pH up into the eight, which is in the safe, uh, safe area. Uh, again, pH, we have some lethal pHs out there. Four and 11 is lethal. When you start getting down around five and 10 after stress, one of the problems we see with low pH. Uh, is that will affect the reproduction of fish, can interfere with fish reproduction, which results in poor fish populations. Here's just an example of water, uh, of al low alkalinity water versus high alkalinity in relation to pH uh, swings in a pond. Waters with very low alkalinity have very big swings in pH versus waters of high alkalinity, which has a more flattened curve or very small swings of pH. Usually in the morning, we're going to see the lowest pH because carbon dioxide is being produced by nighttime respiration from the algae that's in the water. So we can see it gets down, you can see we're down around six and a half uh, or can get even lower. Well, with water of high uh, Alkalinity, we don't get that low in the morning. We have very flat. Then in the afternoons of low alkalinity, we can see very high. You can see we can get up into 10. And remember, 11 is stress is lethal, 10 is stressful. So we can see that we can end up with some stress on our fish with uh, low alkalinity water. Uh, where do we get the oxygen? Uh, we get it from photosynthesis plants and algae in the water. Algae is what we're looking for. We're looking at photo, uh, phytoplankton algae in the water. These are single cell algae that you see in the water. This is the, uh, the producer, the bottom trophic level producer of a pond. Uh, the sunlight uh, is used as an energy source to take carbon dioxide and convert it to, to 
food, and the byproduct of that conversion is oxygen that gets into the water. That's your main source of oxygen and water. We can get some diffusion by wind action and movement of air over the surface of water. Uh, oxygen meter is nice to have, but they're very expensive. Again, oxygen levels, you know, anything above five is good. Typically, most farm ponds are not going to have any issues uh, with oxygen, but eventually there is a problem with turnover. I'm going to talk about that later on. Uh, when it starts getting too low, uh, below five, it gets stressed and it gets too low, around three, we can see some uh, fish die. That's part of a, a perfect pond uh, management scheme. You can add some kind of aeration to your to your to to uh, to your pond to increase the oxygen and prevent nighttime uh, oxygen problems or turnovers. Uh, you may be uh, uh, want to uh, test your water on a regular basis. You might want to want to get a, some type of water test kit. Uh, water test kits are expensive. You know, three hundred fifty to four hundred for a very nice one. Uh, like this hawk kit here that's in this photograph. Or you can just look for some strips, test strips, which are fairly useful to tell you what you have in your water. Uh, oxygen is, is critical, but, you know, hardness and alkalinity, we're probably only checking that once or twice a year. pH the same. We don't worry about ammonia, nitrites, and chlorides and, and, uh, pond, uh, and farm pond. But you might look at temperature. Uh, to see if fish are ready to spawn or not. But that's most of these test kits, like this fish farming kit, has all these parameters. And also has a chemical means for oxygen. Uh, and these kits, these hawk kits, come with eight parameters for testing. And the temperature is just a thermometer. OK. Again, what we would like to do for our farm pond to see if we got the correct hardness and alkalinity in the pond. We can check that twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. If we really need to, to uh, it could probably go once a year if we really needed to. Uh, you know, sometimes you get money pond, you may want to add some gypsum to it to get rid of that. And that's going to add some calcium to the water. And gypsum is this uh, 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 calcium sulfate that you can add to the water. Again, oh, I got to change this one. Uh, at one time, the way well, DGIF is now DWR, um, no longer the Department of Game and Animal Fisheries, but the Department of Wildlife Resources. Uh, they produced a nice little management book on uh, Virginia ponds for fishing. Uh, there's no sense, well, I've, there was no reason for anybody to recreate that. They did that years ago. You can find uh, sections of this at their website. Again, uh, when we're talking about ponds, trying to make a perfect pond, we're talking about some kind of balance that takes place in this pond uh, between the different trophic uh, levels. Uh, oops, go there. Now, I thought it was and we got the phytoplankton algae, which are the producers that's going to feed our, our zooplankters, and that's going to end up feeding baby fish and bluegills, and the bluegills are going to end up uh, feeding the largemouth bass. So we get a good fish population, and it's a balance between if one of these things get out of kilter, you know, too much bluegills or too much bass, too much algae, the pond can get out of balance. Okay, management tools. You know, we want to create a nice fishing area. Um, you know, pond is if you build a new pond, look at the design of it. Look at what kind of aesthetics you might put into docks. You want to make sure that the pond has a, uh, at least a three foot depth around the edges to, to control weed. You want to look at liming. And you want to look at the fertilization. You can add phosphorus to the water. That will increase the algae growth that trophic level uh, to, that feeds the zooplankters and the little baby fish. 
then you want to look at how well you manage the fish population because you can overfish your, your fish uh, for fishing pressure. Uh, largemouth bass are notoriously fished out of ponds. Uh, they're very easy to catch through angling them in a pond, and this can result in a, a population of, of very low bass that results in a high bluegill population with frozen pond out balance. Okay, some of the things we want to look at, uh, we talk about Wyman. If you're going to do a fertilization program, you start when water temperature hits around 60, 65, and you do that through, there's many ways of doing that. Uh, chemical control, if we got a weed problem, we're going to be looking between April and June. Biological control, you can do that any year. If we're going to stock any uh, new pond, we're going to stock the bluegills in red year. Uh, in October, then we're going to come back with our bass in May. But you can stock these anytime in a new pond. Now, now if you got a pond with fish already, and you can go out there and start stocking small fingerlings in there, all you end up doing is just feeding the fish. Uh, catfish, you can stock them at about any time. And then sometime in uh, June and July, you can do a little minnow seine net around the edges to see if you can find uh, reproduction of the fish, like baby bluegills and, and small bass. Uh, just said catfish spawns uh, in June, Bass about March through mid-May, uh, and bluegills in uh, June to September. And bluegills are going to spawn several times during their spawning season. Bass always spawn first uh, because the baby uh, bass are looking for small zooplankton. That's the reason it's important to have that phytoplankton algae out there feeding the zooplankton so you can have a good healthy population. Uh, you can add some pathhead minnows to your uh, bass during this time to allow to feed on the small fish. Uh, you can feed uh, feed between March and October if you want to do some feeding. Oops. Uh, then if you want to do a winter, winter drawdown uh, because of weed problem, problem do it uh, sometime in late winter, November when the water temperature is very cold and try to get refilled before March. Uh, pond maintenance Always look for doing things like that, checking your dam, looking for your experiment, your emergency spillway, make sure you don't have trees and bushes on there, clean from the outside toe out 30 yards from the toe of your outside levee. Uh, make sure you got good grass cover on your levee. Um, yeah, we just said, uh, check dam, look for any erosion look for any signs of leaks. Uh, again, keep things from growing on your dam. Uh, do this a couple of times a year. Winter is a good time to check your pond because you don't have all that uh, green stuff to, to interfere with what you're looking at. Uh, remove any debris, uh, repair your emergency spillway, uh, inspect fences around the pond, and, what, and check your roads, make sure that uh, if you got a dry hydrant that's uh, accessible for fire use, fire engine use, or pump trucks, or so that they can get to it and get water for a fire out in the rural area. That's very important. Okay. Recreational fisheries, you know, the ideal situation, you go out there and get some nice big bass, but you gotta be careful about how much bass you want to feed bluegills. Uh, artificial lures is the name of the game when you're in a a farm pond, the only uh, live bait we're going to talk about is crickets and worms. Again, uh, the only fish that we're stocking in, in these farm ponds is basically bass and bluegill. This is your uh, um, population in most farm ponds. Your bluegills is what we call the forage fish. Uh, the bass are our predator fish. They're feeding on the bluegills. Uh, this is what keeps the population and check and balance. You, even with catfish, you need to have bass out there. Trout, if the water temperature is always below 70 degrees, you can add them to your pond or you can put them out there in the wintertime, but don't expect them to survive in the summer. Again, spawning takes for bass takes place in the spring. 
Uh, and when you put them first, put them out there in a pond, when you first add them to the pond, you will want to wait two years before you start fishing for bass. Uh, again, you probably would originally start, start off with 50 to 100 fish per surface acre. Again, 60, 65, so they're going to spawn early. Bluegills, and you stock them in the springtime, and uh, you're talking about 500 to 1,000 fish if you stock in a new pond. They, when water temperature hits around 75 degrees, that's when we see reproduction takes place. This is going to provide uh, young of the food for the young of the year of bass. We can do some uh, checks of the well, side of the pond and with a same net, see if we're getting reproduction somewhere time in mid June or July. Uh, again, this is just some suggested stocking guides if you start out. Uh, if you want to do a low management, again, remember a uh, perfect pond requires management inputs. If you're trying to keep the management, you know, say 500 bluegills, 100 bass, 50 bass, if you want to do a more intense management, you can go with a higher number of bluegills and, and uh, bass when you stock that pond out. Uh, there's various stocking rates. Some suggest some radiator. Radiator is nice to have. Some catfish is nice to have. It just depends on what you like in your pond. But again, remember, bluegills is your forage fish that's going to feed the largemouth bass. Okay, if you're just doing catfish, uh, no, uh, no bluegills, you still got to have some bass because you want to be able to control the reproduction of the catfish so you don't get too much catfish in the pond. Uh, and this, this is just an example of uh, what happens uh, with a bass in a pond if you try to stock fish. Uh, they will take a fairly large fish. So, you know, if you're stocking small bluegills and bass in there, uh, they're going to be consumed. So you need at least an eight inch or 10 inch catfish or a grass carp to keep it from, uh, from happening, uh, from being a food item for your bass. Fathead minnows are a good thing to add in the springtime. Uh, anywhere from five to 10 pounds of uh, fatheads per uh, surface acre. I got 500 to 1,000 number, but now they sell them by the pound. So we're looking at five to 10 pounds per acre. Other fish to stock, we mentioned Ed Red Ear, Catfish, Fathead, Hybrid Bluegills is okay. Copper Nose is just a variety of bluegill. Hybrid Bluegills, you gotta be a little bit careful because this is a cross between a green sunfish and a bluegill. And you can get what we call back crosses and reproduction out there where you can get a a, a sunfish that's more green sunfish than bluegills, and green sunfish is really not a desirable uh, sunfish for farm ponds. Uh, bluegills are, but some people like the hybrid because hybrid bigger, which means that these guys are going to get bigger, uh, faster, and be more aggressive when it comes to the fishing uh, and angling experience in a pond. Okay, what species not to talk, stock? Again, personal preference. Uh, one thing we don't like to see is crappie. You need about 15 acres or so of a pond uh, for crappie because the ecological uh, uh, distribution of, of, uh, of uh, crappie in a small pond is not very good. The one of the problems is that crappie is spawning the same time as your bass. So their competition for resources at the time of the bass are producing little babies at the same time as the prep. Uh, golden shiners, this is one, one uh, bait fish that you want to avoid. Uh, if you get them in there, they will take over a pond, gar, bullhead, yellow perch, green sunfish, carp, uh, unless it's grass carp to control your uh, weeds. Blue catfish and uh, now it's illegal in the state of Virginia for stocking in ponds. Okay, how to achieve a perfect pond. Believe it or not, you can buy it in a bottle. Uh, this is the fertil fertilizer that we've been talking about that allows you to promote uh, phytoplankton growth in a pond. Uh, 
this comes as a liquid. It's basically increasing the phosphorus levels in a pond, which are the limiting uh, factor for uh, algal growth in a pond. So by applying this on a, a regular basis, you can maintain the algal <coughs> bloom that's in, in, in the pond. Uh, and my dog is, is, uh, is in agreement with this as a perfect pond. So he says you better get it. Okay. Uh, pond balance, we've been talking about that. Pond balance means we've got some big bluegills, big brim. And we don't, and we're talking about five, seven, eight inch fish. We're not talking about a bunch of three to four, three to five, three to four fish. We're talking about fish better than five <laughs> inches in a pond. Okay. Okay. My computer. Okay. We want to check. Check in the uh, in June, July for reproduction uh, for bass and bluegills to see if they're in balance. Okay, what happens if we can end up with an overcrowded bluegill? This happens because most of the time we fish out our bass and we have some small bass in these situations. But the problem is we have lots of small bluegills, two to four inch bluegills. Uh, and occasionally we're going to see some very large bass in there. Um, the one thing that we can do is add some uh, bass to the situation, nine to 10 inches of, in size to help uh, reduce the small number of bluegills. We might see a lot of other critters out there like tadpoles and crawfish. Harvest uh, bass that's uh, greater than 15 inches after 30 pounds of bluegill are taken is what you want to do. So, so you want to watch your harvesting Make sure that you're harvesting some bluegills. Uh, basically, when it comes to bluegills and bass, what we want to do, what we want to do is harvest five to 10 pounds of bluegills for every pound of bass we take out of there. So if you can keep that out, I got a, another slide to show you what you really need to do. Okay. Overcrowded uh, largemouth bass. These are a bunch of small, six inches, eight inch um, small bass in a pond. Very numerous. You're going to see some very large bluegills in this situation because anything got past this feeding line, you know, you got to realize you got all these small uh, baby bluegills that are one to two inches, three inches, and these uh, small bass are go are hungry and they're looking for food. And they're, they're sucking up every small bluegill they can find. And if any bluegill gets bad at, by that mouth and gets big enough where they can't eat it, it's going to be a big bluegill down there. And we're going to see some uh, some bass over four pounds in a situation like this. But, uh, but this is a situation. But the easiest way to correct this is you just catch a little bit more bass to get them out of the system. Okay, pond balance. We've been talking about this. You can use a seine net, go out there, a hundred foot seine net, and do a little seine and see what how many bluegills we have in the three to five, the five to eight. If we have a lot of bluegills in the five, eight, we're in good balance. If we see some uh, fair number of bass in the five, one and a half to four pound uh, situation, we're good. And if we see a lot of small bass, 11, 14, we're in very good condition. Now, this is probably the easiest way, the simplest way to check is to do a reproduction check. Uh, you do this in late uh, June, early thing. You use a minnow saying, you do a marginal saying here, to illustrate it here, go on. You, look, you can look for your uh, nesting areas. If you get some small, young of the year bass and some bluegills, you're in good shape. Okay, how to increase bluegill reproduction so we get a nice string of bluegills to eat. Well, we can feed them some food between May and August. This will increase the uh, the uh, the uh, reproductive activity of the of the bluegills so they'll spawn more than once. Bluegills can spawn 
as many as five times. You can increase their uh, spawning areas by adding some pea gravel spawning areas. They like to have gravel to spawn around. You can also increase uh, fish structures out there for survival to increase survival of the bluegills. Uh, again, uh, Christmas trees, rock piles, tires, concrete blocks. Again, example of, of a spawning nesting area. I believe a bass will do the same thing. Uh, uh, live bait, only crickets and worms. Again, harvest 10 pounds of bluegill before one pound of bass. So what you have to do if you want to get bass, you don't harvest one pound of bass, you harvest 10 pounds of bluegills before you go out catching bass. So if you want to get a nice three pound bass out of your system, you got to have to catch 30 pounds of bluegills. And if they're in the five, if they're in seven, eight inch bluegills you're getting out of there, that's going to be a nice fish fry. Again, keep some records, you know, so you can know what you're catching. Uh, simplest way, if you want to keep up, there's a little alternate check that works very well, is you get a five gallon bucket. And when you get that filled up with bluegills, you can get one pound. So if you need to catch about a three pound, two pound uh, bluegill bass, uh, two or three buckets full of bluegills is needed. So this is an easy way of managing your fishing population. But again, be careful about harvesting bass because you can over harvest the bass. And this bucket would be not big bluegills, but little tiny bluegills. Okay, fish scales. We do occur out there. Uh, you may have a pond that's been around for 25, 30, 40 years and never had one problem. Then bam, we get something that causes a turnover or we do something about uh, fertilizing our algae, we get too much algae, or we uh, try to use some aquatic herbicide to control some vegetation and we didn't do it properly, or we get some kind of turnover water temperature inversion, maybe diseases can all cause uh, fish scales. But the main thing that causes fish scales is pond turnover. If you look at a schematic of a pond, only the top half or top part of the water is productive. It's the part that's having the oxygen. If you look at the bottom, we end up with an anaerobic area that uh, has sludge and anaerobic activity, take place, and there's no oxygen down there. And what happens is we get a thunderstorm come by and it mixes all that water that's on the bottom that's devoid of oxygen with the good water on top and oxygen levels drop dramatically and we have a fish kill. It won't kill all the fish, there will be survivors and they will come back. Okay. Okay, now you may have some birds hanging around and they do eat fish. And it's, you know, one blue carrot here and there is not gonna be a problem, but if you are bothered by it, you can try to scare them off uh, or include them. If you're doing some uh, cage culture around your ponds, uh, they can be problematic. They might actually poke the fish and cause the fish to get a wound. Or you can send an angry bird and, and chase them off. You know, drones are used for everything now. Okay. Okay, let's start talking about some other stuff. Let's move into kind of the uh, some of the problems we may see with ponds being in there that, that we've been fearful of or everything that pops up uh, in, in these uh, ponds. And we're talking a little bit about weed control here. Uh, the brain eat amoeba. Well, the odds of getting this are pretty darn low. You're more likely to get hit by lightning before this. But unfortunately, um, the uh, amoeba enters the nose of your uh, olfactory uh, up lobes and goes into your brain. And the best way to keep that, you just use a nose uh, clip to keep water from getting up your nose. They do occur, uh, they're, they're out there, it does happen. And when it gets the trophozoites do get in the brain, it's pretty fatal. Uh, we don't have a, a many antibiotics to do that. And they actually, uh, they're eating the brain causing high fever. 
and it's usually uh, mainly males and usually in stagnant warm water uh, going fishing, uh, swimming in. So, uh, I'll, as again, I wouldn't worry about it if you do have concern. Just the uh, a nose clip will, will prevent that and really reduce any uh, chances here. Uh, probably uh, something that's popped up in, in over a couple of years is harmful algal blooms. They occur, they do to mainly blue-green algae. Uh, microcystis is the one of the algaes that is in this uh, group. And it can produce toxins that not only kill fish, they can kill animals too. Uh, there's some protozoans out there. Uh, glenoids uh, is a one that you see that typically occurs in the hot summer month in August. They have some red pigment on it and they can produce a red tie type situation that's uh, produced an exotoxin that can kill fish. Uh, again, exotoxin, let's see. Here we go, blue-green algae. The reason I show this is because there's been some horrific uh, incidents with uh, dog owners. Uh, their dogs got into water with some green algae. Within 20 minutes, they were dead. So, you know, you need to be careful with the animals. One thing that you can do to check to see if you got blue green algae in a water, you can either look for the, the microcystis type, or you can take a, a jar of the algae that's in there and you mix it up and let it settle overnight. If the, the algae goes to the bottom of the jar, it's just regular phytoplankton algae. If it uh, floats to the top, it's blue green. And this is good for most uh, fairly decent tests for this. Or you can buy uh, blue green test strips to test for water uh, out there and they run the I think $30. So actually there's te uh, commercially available uh, test strips for tests of blue, blue greens in your pond. Okay, weed management. Uh, let's go through this. We're starting to run out of time. Uh, management methods, preventive management, biological, chrome, mechanical. Chemical is basically what we really uh, do a lot of times and we have some integrated management where we do some chemical, mechanical, and biological. Uh, management method, prevention is always better. Uh, this is just a uh, weed cutter that cuts weeds. Okay, proper construction is good. Maintenance of a pond. Uh, make sure you use the label, label aquatic herbicide label is the law. Make sure you read it and apply the correct uh, concentrations and distribution. Uh, have some client, aquatic weed management plan. What do you do when you start seeing uh, weeds? What you gotta do? Again, aquatic herbicides cost money. Biological methods, um, grass carp, they cost money. And when you build your pond, make sure you construct it so you get that three foot uh, edge that's necessary to keep a lot of emergent weeds out. Okay. You know, the pond site selection where you site, where not you're going to get influx of uh, uh, plants and algae from other places. Uh, what's your fertilization program? You know, fertilization with phytoplankton will keep a lot of uh, emergent weeds out. Water, water, growl, water growl down to, to uh, get rid of some of the uh, shore weeds away by freezing them. And I mean, you want to start early uh, scouting of your pond and getting a proper identification so you can get the proper control. So early scouting for weeds and getting the identification and looking for the proper control is a good prevention and management practice. Again, biological control, um, you're going to need a permit for this. They're not that expensive. You go to DWR, you can fill out the uh, paperwork and pay your $10 for this. They're running about $10 to $15 each. You want a fairly large grass cart because if you've seen uh, the previous uh, slide with the bass eating the catfish, uh, grass carp are much easier to consume uh, because they're just the right shape for a, a large mouth bass to get a hold of and ingest. 
they're not effective on all the algae. There's some algae they like, uh, and some algae and, and some stuff they don't like. So, and they're about effective for about six years. And after that, you use the new ones. I just, the list of some things, uh, Eldia, Hydrilla, uh, Naiads, Muskrats are very easily controlled by, by uh, grass carp. Um, duckweed, nah, not really great. Uh, some of the other coontail, water primrose, filaments algae, not that great. Small, small uh, grass carp uh, in the three to five inch range will do good on algae, but the bass would love you uh, for feeding them. And there's a lot of stuff, cattails, parrot feather, uh, standard drug. There's a bunch of other stuff that they don't like eating. Uh, there's manual methods for harvesting. You got to remember, most of a plant is water. 90% of plant is water. Uh, chemical control, uh, again, defecation weed, uh, good selection, read the label for you. And the expense, and we want to look at the water temperature because you got to have the uh, chemicals reacting with the plant so it take care of it. Early spring, you might have to do retreat uh, treatments. Again, we want to look at pH. Some pH is uh, necessary for proper control of using certain chemicals. Read the label and see what it says there. Um, there's uh, chemicals that are, are for contact or some systemic. That's the reason for 65 degrees because it's taken up in the plant and how it, it, it kills the plant. Uh, Diquat in the fall. Complex copper kilts on contact. One of the things like 2,4-D, 4-D, sodium, dry crop, dry crop, got to be taken up into the plant in order to kill it. And that's the reason we have to look at water temperatures. Again, did you look at your charts? There's various uh, uh, lists of uh, weeds, and a lot of there's a lot of good stuff out there. It tells you where or not it's going to be an excellent uh, control good to fair or even poor. So usually you want something that uh, has an excellent rating for that particular weed. So you try to match the chemical. And a lot of times there's a lot of times that these chemicals are expensive. So you must got to make sure that you match it up. You, know, you don't want to use the wrong chemical for the wrong uh, weed and find out it doesn't control it or it has only uh, fair control. Uh, integrate, we're talking about Again, combination of uh, chemicals, biological, proper construction and maintenance. But just to give you an idea, these are kind of old numbers. Uh, chelated copper, like cop, Keytrain Plus, $41 a gallon. Diquat, $66. Uh, sonar, $400 some dollars per, per pint. Again, uh, this is some expensive. Some of the newer ones are even more expensive. So it's imperative that you uh, pair the right chemical with the correct feed that you have. Now, quick awkward shape, that's pretty nice. It uh, reduces a certain wavelength of light. Uh, photosynthesis only operates on two wavelengths and this kind of reduces those wavelengths so you don't get that uh, overgrowth of uh, plants and algae in a pond. Uh, this is runs about thirty to forty dollars a gallon, and uh, it works fairly well in some incidents. Uh, filament is algae, copper sulfate's best, but you have to worry about alkalinity. Water is a low low alkalinity. Copper can be very uh, toxic to fish. Uh, Cutrin plus is good. Diquat works, and there's some other stuff like Green Clean, Hydrothor one ninety one works on algae. Uh, Cara, another type of algae. Uh, free float plants, we get a lot of uh, questions on free float plants like uh, watermill and duckweed. Uh, Clifford is pretty good at uh, controlling that. Sonar will do that too. Diquat, but the clipper works very well. Uh, and it works on other stuff too. Uh, floating plants like uh, mother hyacinth, duckweed, and watermelon, you mentioned. Diquat works, again, 
on some of this stuff. Uh, emergent weeds like cattails, we're probably talking about rodeo in most cases for some of the emergent weed or 2,4-D, depending on what's going on. Again, match the right one. You've got clear cast. At uh, irrigation, I got this down here. If you use some of these chemicals, you need to look at some of the restrictions on these uh, chemicals uh, for irrigation, watering livestock, swimming of that nature, and drinking the water. Some have restrictions on it, so pay attention to the restrictions for each chemical. Merchant plants like water shield, you know, we're talking about 2,4-D and something like this. Sometimes you have to use surfactants. Uh, Submerged plants, sonar works real well. That's the one that's a lot of folks are very expensive. This is one that you would uh, treat the whole pond for to get rid of. So that becomes a very expensive proposition. You know, a thousand dollars for a gallon is pretty expensive. Uh, reward, another type of for NIAG, you can use that reward. Again, coontail, submerged plants, hydrilla, hydrilla. Uh, grass carp. Again, just what I was talking about here is a little table uh, showing you different uh, chemicals. Uh, let's see now. Diquat, this is one to two days. Dairy, livestock, crop withdrawal. See, if you put diquat, you, you know, you don't want to irrigate uh, within five days. So you don't have all this stuff like fluoridone, you know, look at the different uh, requirements and watch with it. We know the copper uh, for some uh, animals like uh, sheep is very sensitive to copper. But you gotta be careful. Uh, again, um, there's some plant identification uh, guides out there. DW uh, Department of Wildlife Resources has a, a basic uh, weed guide for more, for some of the more common weeds that we see. Again, uh, if you don't want to do some of this stuff yourself, there are consultants available. Go to the Department of Wildlife Re uh, Resources and, and do this. There's some of the stuff uh, like doing chemicals, you need to be careful about doing it. It's best to have somebody that's, that's licensed to do that. Also, it, these folks will also do lime and, and do management checks and stuff like that, or help you in doing a plan for your ponds. So there's consult. Uh, other than that, we can uh, help you on a lot of things by answering technical questions and help you uh, make some good decisions. Um, until until COVID-19 came in time, we used to go out and do a lot of visitation to farm ponds and, and do a lot of testing of water to see what's going on. Again, uh, at this time, you're going to have to probably do some of this stuff yourself. Okay, questions. Doc, there's a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, okay. One person has an old farm pond in oak and cedar woods. Do you want to talk about that as far as dam safety and that kind of thing? Uh, oh. There's two parts to this. The other's about cattails, but I didn't know if you wanted to talk to, you know, Talk about some of the trees on the dams oh, yeah. and in the emergency spillways and that kind of thing. Yeah, we again that's something that you got to uh, pay attention to because uh, if you start getting trees on there, that could weaken the dam and cause a breach of the dam and cause some of those issues. Even if you got trees on there now, it's best to start thinking about removal of the trees, uh, destumping. Uh, the uh, area where you have the tree and repack it. You, you would not want to do all of them at once, but you would want to start doing them on a regular basis until you get rid of all your trees. Uh, any uh, woody bushes and, and stuff like that that's on your pond, bush hog them down, get rid of them. Uh, you want your outside slope to be uh, Bermuda grass if you can do that. Uh, and the toe of the levee, you want to be able to clean out 30 yards from the total levee should be no nothing growing, no trees or bushes. So you should have a clear area behind the dam if you can do it. I know some of the older dams, it's that way. I've seen dams that has trees on it. But eventually the dam's going to break down 
over time. That those trees, uh, you know, roots and all that get a good strong wind. The trees go uproot and to cause a breach in the dam, and and you will be probably responsible for what's goes down downstream. So and, and this, yeah, and this same pond apparently is full of cattails. Is that good or bad? And how can I control them? And is there a good use for them? Well, uh, that's a that's a good question all the way around. It uh, goes back uh, uh, to the original uh, question: What makes a good pond? What's a perfect pond? Cattail is a good place for habitat for uh, breeding areas for birds, water birds, uh, especially red winged blackbirds like it. Uh, rodeo will get rid of them, or mechanical harvesting of them. Or another good use is that you can consume the roots of the uh, cattail as a food item. The uh, young shoots of the uh, of the cattail it makes an edible salad. Uh, so it's up to you. You know, you can either get rid of them or try to control them. Uh, it depends on where or not. You see that as a problem, or perceive that as a problem for your thing. Um, I see another chat come up about. Well, this one is completely full. So, if they wanted to get rid of everything, would they want to consider renovation? Renovation is, is one approach, but again, that's going to be a a uh, approach that's going to be very expensive. If the pond's that shallow, uh, that has uh, the cattails throughout the whole pond, uh, you know, you're talking about a major job, depending on how size, and you probably gonna have to get a permit for that. Okay, and then uh, how do you measure an acre of a pond? <laughs> uh, imagine a football field. I use, use that, how about that? It was about football size and length. Uh, you can do, do that. Okay, and uh, so, and the other is, uh, there's another one, any tips for repairing a leaky pond? Well, uh, uh, Ben and I quite sometimes works. Organic materials sometimes help, phosphorus. Uh, if you get a leaky uh, pond, you know, where is it seeping? It's seeping from a bomb or top, but you can try to repack the area, try to find out where the leaking on the inside and Try to put down bentonite clay in that area. Try to figure out where it's leaking, and that's usually the um, recommendation for leaking ponds is to uh, locate where the leak is and use uh, um, bentonite clay as the material to pack that area to reduce that leakage. And another question is: is how do you sample the mud? only accessible from the edges? Uh, you can use a boat to get out there. You take a stick, a, 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 take a, get a tin can, a, a, a PVC pipe, and attach it to the PVC pipe, and you reach down there and grab some mud. Okay. Uh, and it's, there's another question. Uh, a couple of years ago, a group of roving otters wiped out all the ponds in the area. Is there a, in an effective way to protect against this? Uh, well, if you have an otter problem, you could hire a trapper to get rid of them. And that may be one of those things that they contact the Department of Games since they're fur burning animals as well. Yeah. Well, there is okay. consult consultant and there is trappers people that are DWR will give you a list of trappers that do these kind of things and either they charge for it or they will ask you know if they think it's worth their time and effort they will do come out and do trapping for for that otter for uh, trying to make some money so it can go either way it could be free or be a charge yeah and there's uh how deep does a pond need to be to have a viable fish population? At least four to six feet. Okay. And yeah. how do you find, and, and okay, and the other is how do you find leaks? How do you find le leeches? Leaks. 
Oh, leeks. As in leeks in a pond. Yes. Oh, yeah, I see it now. I thought somebody said leeches. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, but that's what you do during the winter time. You go around and inspect the, uh, the dam and see if you see any seepage come out to be a wet area. Uh, it would be very obvious. That's all I see right now. Yeah. Yeah. And we have, and if you're interested in some of this other stuff on pond problems, we have a, uh, uh, a recorded video of a several programs we've done in the past strictly on this type of issues uh, on this. We spent a whole hour talking about this. So we do have some links at our website, YouTube website on this. And again, uh, we will- uh, are, And there, are there any organic methods for, uh, for weed control? Basically that would be mechanical, would it not? Well, kind of. Uh, there's really not, not any really organic methods unless you use a barley straw method, which doesn't work that well. Uh, there is some uh, green clean pro, I think, is supposed to be somewhat, it's not really organic, but it's supposed to be better than some of the other chemicals. Yeah. Again, any anytime you have a, a weed problem, you've got to decide uh, is it something that's really offensive, offensive? And is it worth uh, spending the money to control it? And if I had a pond, I probably wouldn't be controlling that. Be it would be a natural pond. The only thing I'd be worried about is uh, making sure my dam structure is in good shape. And I'd be money more well spent than controlling weeds. Okay. Again, now, if any of y'all want uh, Dr. Crosby's uh, PowerPoint slides, I did put his email address in the chat box. I'll yeah. um, make another copy and put it in, in yeah. case you, you know you don't have to scroll back up. So. Yeah. If you'll send him a note by email, he can get you a PDF of the presentation if you would like it. Okay. Well, I appreciate everybody coming to this uh, uh, Zoom meeting on uh, basic uh, pond management. We just barely covered everything that's uh, necessary to understand about uh, pond management. Uh, there's uh, can be more details in this. And uh, again, thanks for coming today. Uh, again, uh, this is great. It's been a great help, and Mark has been a tremendous help in uh, doing this program today. And uh, and I think we've gone over our one hour mark now. Mm -hmm. This is. So we have what, uh, how many folks show, what we have, 27? How many? Yep, 27 at the max, so that's all. 27. So thank, oh, and, uh, oh, and there's another question in here. What what was the stuff to block the dam that would be bentonite clay? You might want to put, yeah. so you might want to write that, you might want to put that in the chat box to everyone, Doc, just in case. Okay. Okay. About Ben and I, right? <laughs> I just go put down B clay. <laughs> I can't spell. Yeah, you know. Ben and I. It's a, it's all it's that it's information. Actually, it's information. Readily available. In fact, USDA has a book on uh, 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 dam management. I tell you all this kind of stuff. Yeah, 
There you go, Doc. I bet I'm glad you spell better than I do. Uh. Uh, where can you purchase the bent nut clay? Uh, some farm supply stores may have it. You need to call around. But. Yeah. Yeah, they probably sell that in bags or whatever. It's available. And again, if you're looking for that, you got to make sure you got a wig for it, you know. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, please uh, email me if you need to get this, please. <laughs> 